Today we have Enric, and he's going to talk about uh, five vertex models. Thank you, everyone, for coming. Hey, uh, thanks for the invitation. Um, happy to give a talk, uh, even though it's like 8 p.m. for me. <laughs> I'm a little sleepy, but uh, we'll see how it goes. Uh, first of all, this is um, joint work with, by the way, you know, there's a number of people in the audience here who've seen this talk already and are even co-authors. But the uh, Jan, uh, Jan is the co-author. Sam Watson is at he's at Melbourne. Uh, Sam Watson is at Brown. Istvan Praus is a, in Finland, University of Eastern Finland, who is probably asleep right now. But uh, okay. <laughs> and also, uh, he and I uh, have been collaborating, and he's going to give a talk in two weeks about uh, the sort of this is sort of a two-part series. I'm giving the first part and he's going to sort of give uh, further developments, I guess, in two weeks, right? Okay. So what's the five vertex model? And yeah, feel free to stop me or, or interrupt me uh, for any reason whatsoever. I'm happy to discuss any aspect here. I don't think I'll take the full time otherwise. Uh, I guess I can do this. There. Is that better? Is that any different for you guys? Uh, all right. So what is the five vertex model? Let me remove that stuff for myself. Um, it's a model which sits, no, this is not good. I'm gonna do this way. It's a model which sits somewhere between the uh, uh, Lawson styling model, which is a very, very familiar model, determinantal model, and the six vertex model, which is a more, also a familiar model, but uh, uh, still sort of unsolved in full generality. And, uh, if you know about these things, this is it's a special case of the six vertex model where the delta parameter goes to plus or minus infinity. But you know you don't need to know that. Here's a very simple definition. Um, we take the square grid Z2 in the plane or some subgraph of the square grid. And at each vertex, we have one of these five configurations here, the empty vertex or you know, the, the other ones as shown. And so we're considering subgraphs of the square grid, which have these local properties at each vertex. And uh, here's, a, here's a simulation down here. It, they just make a monotone northeast lattice paths, which are disjoined from each other. Okay. In this, how is it different from the six vertex model? Because we're not allowing the, the case where the, the paths uh, uh, bounce off each other. And um, there are, uh, we're considering we're going to consider the full model, so five different weights. But of course, two of them, uh, look, the I same. Can... Two of them look the same. Is that a typo? Yeah, that's right. No, that's not a typo. I'm, I, yeah. So the thing is, you know, every time you have a left turn, uh, it has to be followed eventually by a right turn. So you can so the number of left turns and, and right turns essentially pair up, at least for the boundary conditions, the sort of standard boundary conditions. So you might as well uh, replace the, the, those two weights just by the, their geometric mean. It doesn't change any of the, it doesn't change the weight of any configuration. And uh, right, so that removes one degree of freedom. And then the other degree is just a scaling and there's no reason not to scale all the weights. So for example, the one on the left has weight one. So then you're left with three degrees of freedom and which are in our case R, uh, X and Y. And the way we've represented it, you can you get a weight R per corner. Uh, and, and so every time you turn right or left, you get an R, a factor of R at a vertex. And otherwise the capital X and capital Y, you get E to the X for every uh, vertical edge and E to the Y for every horizontal edge. So the X and the Y parameters control in some sense, the density of horizontal and vertical edges and the R parameter controls the number of corners. All right, and of course, then the, the, we put this, you know, the, a configuration, it, it, th these ways to find a probability measure, a configuration has a probability, you know, E to the VX plus HY times R to the C, where, uh, you know, V is the number of vertical edges, H is the number of horizontal edges, C is the number of corners, and then there's a normalizing constant Z, which is, of course, the, the partition function, that's the fundamental quantity, which we would like to compute for uh, some, in some reasonable, reasonable, reasonably general setting. Okay, any questions? Uh, 
let me get this stuff out of here. I'm gonna, oh, I know, I know what I can do. I just do that. No, I can't do that. Why can't I do that? <laughs> Sorry, I'm having some issues here. Never mind. Let's go back. Okay. Um, how is it related to the lozenge tiling model? Well, on the left, you see the lozenge tiling model with the lozenges colored in three colors, so, you know, red, blue, and green. And if you just look at the blue-green path of lozenges, uh, right, they, you know, they form, they form these non-intersecting paths. You imagine the lattice paths on the right are the paths which go through the centers of those blue-green uh, lozenge paths on the left. And it's actually, it's just a bijection between the model on the left and the model on the right. Uh, except that when we, so when we, when we discuss lozenge tilings, usually we're talking about the uniform measure on configurations or some uh, weighted uniform measure. Uh, and so that course, so, so that corresponds to the five vertex model where the R parameter is one. So we get to weight one per corner instead of weight R per corner. And if we turn on the R parameter, that means that the blue and green lozenges interact. So if R is bigger than one, uh, the, the, we get more corners than the lozenge tiling model because corners are preferred. And if R is less than one, then we're sort of suppressing corners. And here's some simulation, here's some simple simulations. Uh, in the center is the R equals one. That's the lozenge tiling case with, with some particular, I just show some particular density of paths uh, in this, on this tour, this you know, end by end torus. Maybe it's like a, I don't, I don't remember, 50 by 50 torus or something. And when R is large, so, so if you fix the density of paths, the S and T, which means controlling the X and Y variables, then uh, you see that when R is 10, you even have lots of corners, so the paths wiggle back and forth a lot and they don't uh, feel each other very much. When R is very small on the right, uh, you know, they pass tend to travel in straight lines with very few corners. And then I increase the density down here uh, in the, on the lower right, uh, 0 0.4, 0 0.4. Um, and you know you can kind of see that it looks like it's forming some sort of large scale structure there, and that's one of the interesting and mysterious things about this model. Uh, when R is small and the densities are large, uh, what is actually going on? That's one thing we don't really understand at, at, at the moment. Okay, yeah, and, and I'm introducing on this slide two new variables, which are called S and T. S is the density of vertical edges. Uh, uh, so it's the, it's the, yeah, for, if you, if you look on a given row, the, the S is the density of some number between zero and one of the number of vertical edges per unit, uh, you know, lattice step. And same thing with T for the horizontal edges. Uh, if you look on a particular column, how many, uh, T edges per, per unit step you see there. And those are of course related to the X and Y variables. Uh, in the following way, uh, I, I, and I'm just showing you the picture in the in the lozenge tiling case. But remember that lozenge tilings are this it's the same configuration space as lozenge tilings. The five vertex model has the same configuration space. It's just that the weights are different. I mean, you get an extra weight per corner. And uh, the nice thing about the lozenge tiling is you can sort of see the three dimensional picture uh, better than the lattice path model. You can you can imagine this. Uh, surface as a projection of a, you know, a three-dimensional surface, and these blue-green segments are delineating the, the sort of level lines, uh, I mean, the, the, the steps when the, the height goes up by one. I guess when I think of it, when I look at this picture, I think of the red areas as being, uh, you know, constant height, and then the, each blue and green is like a step up uh, where the height increases by one. Okay, so yeah, then uh, of course the density of red, green, and blue, uh, uh, the density of red is one minus S minus T. If you look at it this way, you can think of S and T as you know, up to scale, they're just the density of the, the area density of the number of tiles of each type, S, T, and one minus S minus T. Okay, and then, for, then of course S and T determines the slope of this uh, three-dimensional height, uh, three-dimensional surface, right? It, 
if, if everything is red, the slope is like zero. And you know, as S and T increase, the, the, that, that three-dimensional surface uh, has some uh, average gradient, which is determined by S and T. And for each S and T, there's an associated uh, uh, growth rate, which is the uh, weighted sum of tilings or configurations, I should have said, with that particular slope. So if I take my n by n torus, fix the, fix the slope. So I fix the number of blue-green paths, the homology class of the blue-green paths. So the number of the height change going horizontally and the height change going vertically. If I fix that slope and then let the torus get large, the growth rate of the partition function is now going to be a function of S and T. And it grows as exponential of the area times some you know, positive number, which I'm calling minus the sigma. So minus sigma is the growth rate. Sigma is, will be called the surface tension, uh, if you like. And sigma, of course, depends on R and also these other two variables, S and T. OK, and um, if you like to, how, how is sigma related to the, the free energy? f of x, y, what, what, is, what is the free energy? It's just the sort of limiting logarithm of the, I should have written it down on the slide, but it's the, you take the partition function as a function of the original variables, x and y and r. You, uh, you let the system get large and you take the growth rate of f, the growth rate of the partition function, the log of the partition function, oh yeah, no, sorry. The exponential growth rate of the partition function is the free energy f here. And the sigma, sigma is the Legendre dual of the free energy. I think I explained that on the next slide. Or maybe at least I wrote down the formula here. Uh, sigma uh, is the, the surface tension uh, satisfies the, is the Legendre dual of the free energy here. And the, so in the, for, well, okay. So what I want to explain in this talk is that there's an explicit formula for computing the free energy and therefore the surface tension. Uh, While well, you compute them sort of simultaneously, here's, a, here's an actual plot uh, for I think R is something like 0.7 or 0.6. I forgot the exact value of R, but here's the plot of the sur minus the surface tension. So this is a positive quantity and uh, the in terms of S and T. So the S, S, S variable and T variable both range from zero to one, but their sum has to be less than one also because the, remember one minus S minus T, that's the density of the ricks. So you can think of the, this triangle as the space of possible slopes, which is of the surface, which is parameterized by the density of blues and the density of greens. And of course the density of reds is just one minus S minus T. So that's that triangle there. And, uh, the surface tension is this, uh, well, the surface tension itself is convex minus the surface tension, which is what I plotted, uh, is, is con, well, concave, uh, but it's only strictly concave on part of the, uh, of the region here. It's this function turned out to be, at least when R is less than one, it's a only piecewise analytic, right? It's analytic on the, the, here's, here's, here's in fact the plot of the, of the domain of the, the, that triangle is the domain where S and T are defined. And there's two regions. There's the so-called repulsive region where S, where sigma is strictly convex. And there's this region which is labeled non-pure where sigma is just linear, uh, has a fixed, uh, yeah, fixed gradient there. And the line between the two is some function of uh, is some function is some you know hyperbola which uh, which depends on R itself, and you can see that when R goes to one in this formula uh, here that uh, remember when R goes to one you tend to the Lawson's tiling case and then the this non-pure region just goes away and the the right that hyperbola sort of uh, flattens out and becomes just the the hypotenuse of the triangle the diagonal, and so there's no there's only one, uh, I mean, the strictly convex, the surface tension is strictly convex for the Lozenstein case. Okay, so this is a feature of the fine vertex model, which is not present in the Lozenstein model, and, it, and it leads to new physics, new behavior. 
So what, what what's uh, happening on the stochastic lane? What is called stochastic? Yeah, good question. That's where the transfer matrix becomes stochastic. And it's a, just like the stochastic six vertex model, this is the stochastic five vertex model along that line. So you expect completely different uh, fluctuation behavior over there. Yep, yep. And in the non-pure uh, region, do you expect fluctuation behavior to be more like stochastic or more like repulsive JFF? <laughs> well, you know, uh, uh, there are no uh, Gibbs measures in inside the non-pure region. There are no, I mean, translation invariant ergodic Gibbs measures, uh, as far as we understand. Every measure here is really a convex combination of stochastic measures along this, uh, along the hyperbola. Right. You can still try imposing these boundary conditions, but that's not going to work as a pure state. I see. Yeah, so what happens when you impose boundary conditions along this along this curve? That is a good question, which I'm I'm going to get to. So <laughs> I don't know the answer either. Okay, except cool. that the. Uh, uh, but yes, you're asking the right questions, Leo. Uh, okay. Um, yeah, uh, while I'm at it, I must well plot the free energy. The free energy is the Legendre dual. What do I mean by that? Well, here's the, uh, you know, here's the domain where the surface tension is strictly convex. It's some sort of curvy triangle here. The, if you just, uh, if you, you can map that domain through the gradient map to a domain in the XY plane. Here's the X, capital X, capital Y variables. Remember the X and Y variables are the, well, they're called the you know the external field variables. They control. They also control the. Uh, they're the weights of the, of the vertical and horizontal edges respectively. And it, when you right, so the gradient of sigma is a homeomorphism on the interior of the curvy triangle on the left to the interior of this amoeba-like shape on the right, uh, and you know it maps the whole hyperbola, the whole stochastic phase to that single point there. Uh, and right, and oh yeah, oh yeah. So here's the free, here's the plot of the free energy. It's a nice convex uh, uh, function, a convex analytic function defined on this thing, and it happens to be I didn't plot it. It's, it's defined for all x and y. It's just linear outside of that curvy region there. It's also piecewise analytic with three, with four analytic pieces, but it's linear outside with the appropriate slope uh, outside those things. Oh, and I guess yeah, there's also a sort of a, a bend, which I also didn't show. If you, if you start at the point and continue upward, it's, it's, there's, a, there's, a, there's a fold. Because the slope, the slope in this region, the slope up here and the slope down there are different, and, but they meet along this line. OK, that's the free energy. Uh, and OK, that was for the r less than 1 case. R, r is a positive, right? So that r less than 1 means that you don't like to have corners. When you increase, when r is bigger than one, you like to have corners. Uh, then you have different behavior. Uh, the surface tension is now strictly convex on the whole triangle, but it has this interesting feature that it doesn't go to zero along the boundary, at least along the diagonal boundary of the triangle. There's still some positive surface tension, and it's got this sort of point of uh, non-analyticity there at, in the center at, at you know s and t when s and t are both equal to a half. And this in the free energy, which is again the Legendre dual, it leads to this sort of interesting uh, uh, extra phase here. This uh, sort of semi-frozen phase, where the uh, I, I should have drawn you a picture, but it's a it's a picture where you get a, you know everything is in the zigzag. I mean, you're sort of fully packed, and every path is a zigzag. Uh, you know. Northeast, northeast, northeast uh, path. Okay. And of course, but when R equals one, you're back in the Lozenge case. Uh, right. So, so uh, here's a hopefully familiar picture of the Lozenge tiling. This is the uniform Lozenge tiling of some finite region now, the uh, finite hexagon. And um, maybe I can just stop share for a second. 
and share my other I just want to share this picture. So, so you know, we can of course think of this. Uh, this is a Lausitz tiling. Uh, here's a three-dimensional view, which you can rotate around and uh, see that the this is a even though this is this is a random tiling of that uh, hexagon. If you think of it as a three-dimensional shape, uh, it has this interesting uh, you know it, the the actual the randomness. When the mesh size goes to zero, that ran, the random surface lies close to a certain non-random, uh, you know, piecewise smooth surface spanning that those those uh, that boundary condition. The, the boundary condition is, of course, this six sides of a of a cube, six of the you know twelve sides of the cube. But uh, there's this limit shape phenomenon by which the uh, surface in the limit as the mesh size goes zero, the uniform random surface will converge to this. Uh, I mean, the, the we'll get closer and closer to this particular non-trivial surface spanning the boundary. And of course, the, the, there's still some fluctuations away from that, but those fluctuations are of, of smaller order, the order tending to zero with the lattice as the lattice spacing goes to zero. Okay, so now I can go back to the other. Uh, and uh, well, uh, the same result holds for, I think I even, wait. The same result, so here's the, here's the laws and styling limit shape, which is a theorem of Henry Cohn, Jim Prompt, and myself from a long time ago. <laughs> Uh, for the Lausanne tiling, which we proved in the Lausanne tiling case. And uh, uh, let me just read the theorem. You, well, I didn't write all the hypothesis. You have some uh, particular boundary, some region in the plane, which you want to tile with lozenges. And uh, you have, if you think of it as a projection of a three dimensional surface, there's some uh, fixed wireframe in R3 that your, that your surface will span. And you can describe the limiting uh, uh, piecewise smooth surface uh, as the graph of a certain function h from your region r. And that limit, limiting function h is the unique uh, minimizer of a certain surface tension integral, which is written here. You integrate over the region r that you're tiling uh, the surface tension, which is now a function of s and t, which are the x and y derivatives of the of, of your uh, test function h, uh, your your function your function h, and you well, and so you 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 look at this functional of a uh, of a smooth function h, and you try to find try to find the h which minimizes that surface tension integral with fixed boundary conditions, uh, and uh, uh, the because of the slope constraints, the function h has to be Lipschitz. So this is integral is well defined, and you can show that there is a unique minimizer by essentially by a strict convexity of the surface tension function. There's a unique minimizer, and here I just plotted the surface tension function in the Lausitz-Steinle case, just so you can compare. It looks very similar to the previous one, except there's no. Uh, uh, it's it's you know it's strictly it's strictly convex everywhere, and uh, okay. So the theorem of uh, well, there's an analogous theorem for the five vertex model. Uh, and as you can imagine, it has two different statements when R is bigger than one and when R is less than one. Uh, and the statement is the same in the R bigger than one case. Uh, for boundary conditions, as in the previous theorem, which I, which I left out of the slide, uh, you can find a unique limit shape, basically because the surface tension, which we, we can compute, is strictly convex. Strictly convex. Uh, however, in the R less than one case, the situation is more interesting because the surface tension is not strictly convex. It's got this flat piece on it. Uh, uh, it but uh, you know, well, there are conditions when there's a unique limit shape, and those conditions are if you happen to find a minimizer which whose gradient lies in the strictly convex part, 
then sort of by definition, it's a, it will be the unique minimizer. Uh, however, you know, that, that's for the boundary conditions, which we typically, I mean, if for more general boundary conditions, uh, that may not be, may, that may not happen. Uh, and in that case, the set of minimizers of that particular integral equation, that, that particular functional is not, uh, I mean, there's not a unique minimizer. Uh, there's typically many minimizers, uh, although they you know, do form a set of convex uh, functions. Here I'm talking about minimizers of, the, of that particular integral from the previous slide, this integral, the surface tension integral. I'm not talking about minimizers of the actual, well, okay. Yeah, that's okay, never mind. <laughs> Minimize, there are many minimizers of that integral, uh, uh, but they do have the, like, the one fortunate feature that they all, every minimizer shares the same liquid region. But what do I mean by liquid region? The region where the, the repulsive region is what I should say, the region where the gradient is in the repulsive uh, zone. So here's a, here's a for example, a simulation. This is just like, this is the exact same uh, shape, except I, I didn't, I used sort of Cartesian coordinates rather than 120 degree angle coordinates. Sorry, sorry, one more question. So in the previous, uh, in the previous statement, when there is no unique limit shape, does it mean there is no concentration of, sh of shapes on the right scale? This, this statement, uh, so we don't know, right? So <laughs> the statement is about, the minimizers of this integral. Uh, and uh, we can't say anything about what's going on in the actual uh, probability model, but we can say that for this integral, there are many minimizers. Okay, so okay. we don't know which minimizer is, is the limit shape or something. Right, so uh, as far as, let me explain on the next, by, 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 by going through this next slide and then ask me the question again. Okay, here's, here's a sample, a random sample of a five vertex model in the, in the box plane partition boundary conditions, just like on the Lawson styling case that I've been showing, although there's no colors here. And there are many, many paths. I don't know if you can see, but the, the paths are very small. It's like 200 by 200. And uh, here's r equals 0.8, which is indeed less than one. And uh, you know you can see some of the same general features as in the previous model. There's some facets near the corners, uh, but uh, but uh, I hope you can your eye picks out that there's something fishy going on uh, near the centers of the diagonal edges here, here and here. Uh, and indeed, uh, there the it's not in the situation of the first part of the theorem. It's in the situation of the second part. Here's the actual. Here's what we can prove about this model, right? This is the sort of R equals 0.8 box plane partition. There is a, an ovally shape here, this inside the blue region, the one which is foliated by these lines. That's the liquid region. That's the limit shape that we can prove exists. And it has a uh, uh, piecewise analytic boundary uh, with, uh, uh, let's see, like eight different pieces. Right, delineated. So the different pieces of analytic are, are delineated by these uh, red dots. Uh, okay, and outside in the corners, there's still these facets. Like in this corner and that corner, there's a facet, and there's a facet in the other corners. But we don't know how far those facets extend. And in fact, in the center of the edges, there's this mystery region here, uh, here and here, where we really don't know what's going on. So between the, it's it's <laughs> it's kind of small on your screen. I apologize. But uh, between the blue curve and the outer boundary, there's a, little, there's a little region here and we don't actually know about these red, I just put those red lines in there. I don't know exactly where they are, uh, but they're the, supposed to be the boundary, the facet. Uh, in, the, in that region there, we don't really know what's going on. Uh, but, but we can prove that, that the, inside, the, inside the oval is a, the disordered phase where the, the, the repulsive fade, the repulsive slopes, and the height function in there is well defined. And then these the curves you see are the level curves of the height function inside that phase.
Does that help answer your question, Leo? Any other questions? All right. Well, uh, did, you can sorry. Did you did you say you knew what the um, the how to, the shape of that red line, or you don't even know what the exact? Uh... No, that red line. I don't know what the shape is. All okay. I know is that the, the facet here. You know, if if I go horizontally from that red dot, I'm still in the facet, but I don't okay. know how far above it extends. Okay. As far as I know, it's just it's random. That is, for every simulation, I'll get a different. Uh, a different, right? It's what we believe is that in this leftover region, including some part near the red lines or on either side of the red lines, it's a ran it's random, and it depends on the simulation you take. So there is no limit shape in that in those cases. Uh, and you know, uh, you might not worry in the previous case that uh, you know it's just a tiny little region there, but when R decreases, that is when you're you know the the weight per corner is going down, the region about which we know something uh, you know, sort of flattens out like a pancake. And when R becomes one third, one third, this is some function of just of the boundary conditions. If I took a different, different region, it would be a different value of R. But it, you know, the, the, the disordered region, the repulsive region here kind of disappears at some value of R. In this case, R equals one third. And now in this case, we have no information about anything. <laughs> uh, 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 in that uh, regarding the limit shape. And in fact, here's a simulation uh, when R equals 0.4. And you can see that uh, it looks, there's, looks like there's some big structures sort of remaining uh, here. And it's even hard to believe that you can, anyway, if I, if I go even farther down to R equals 0.25, this is below the, the place where there's any liquid region at all. Uh, it looks like you know, there's this sort of big, large features which are random. If I did the simulation another time, I would see you know, different large scale features. I mean, they, they, would be, they would be slightly different from these ones. So we suspect, these simulations, by the way, are very hard to do. And uh, there's no uh, guarantee that our, Monte Carlo algorithm has converged when we did these simulations. So you should take these pictures with a grain of salt, but we do, really don't know how to simulate because the, the state space is, a, you know, this, our particular algorithm is sort of an exponential algorithm as far as we know in this region. But I think they indicate, I mean, you can even see that the, the place where the facets meet each other is, is not even centered along the boundary like it would be in the lozenge challenge case. I need a <laughs> my timepiece. The reason we know that uh, things go badly wrong is that we can construct uh, other minimizers uh, when R is small enough. When R is less than or equal to one third, here's a minimizer of the surface tension, which is just piecewise linear, right? It's just got you know five different pieces, uh, and I try to indicate the the function which gives you the height in each in each of those five five domains. So that's a PL. Uh, minimizer of the surface tension function, uh, which exists for, for all sufficiently small r with the same boundary conditions. Right, so, so you know, what is the behavior in those regions? We, we don't know. Uh, as far as we know, it's random, but it may be that there's some lower order effects, right? Our variational principle only sort of uh, deals with the exponential growth rate. It's possible that if you take into account a lower order, you know, the next order in the in the growth rate, the sub exponential term, then that will pick out one of these guys, one of the things, and it'll give you an actual limit shape. We don't know. Yeah, and uh, what about the case R bigger than one? Uh, here's some simulations. Here there is a unique limit shape. In every case, and but there's also an interesting behavior 
which happens when R equals three, I think the, the, that liquid region splits up into two. This is a phenomenon which you sometimes you can arrange in the, in the Dimer model as well, but here you see it sort of uh, for free in the, in the five vertex model. Okay, so um, what I want to talk about for the rest of the time is how do we do these calculations? How do we compute the free energy and the surface tension in this model? You know, the, the, the nice thing about the Lawson tiling model is that you can solve it with determinants. This model is <clears throat> hard, harder. Uh, you can't just use determinants, right? So we, we went back to the original beta ansatz technique from the, you know, six, I don't know, 40s, 50s, 60s. Uh, uh, what does it mean? We, you know, you put the model on a, so we're trying to compute the free energy uh, as a function of R, X, and Y. X and Y are those, well, R, X, and Y are the three variables which define our weights. We put the model on a cylinder. So it's on a square grid on a cylinder. Uh, so you're supposed to think of this, uh, this as one line of the cylinder wrapping around this way. Of circumference is capital N here. And uh, you can make a transfer matrix which counts how many configurations there are uh, in a row by row method, right? So each configuration is, is uh, on a given row, on a, on a given row between two horizontal edges is you just can indicate a configuration by the positions of the various paths. Right, for example, one, five, and six, and on the next row, the they may be at three, five, and seven. And there's a matrix which tells you how many configurations there are which which connect uh, the configuration with particles at one, five, and six, and three, five, and seven, for example. And in this case, right, you get to four corners, so there's part of the fourth, and then and you get to one, two, three horizontal edges that gives you uh, e to the three y. So there's this, there's this matrix, which is unfortunately two to the n by two to the n, counting all possible states. Uh, and uh, for every pair of states, you have a certain entry, which, which uh, is counting the number of ways to connect those two states. And then uh, you, you need to compute, uh, then t to the k uh, computes the set of configurations. Um, when, you, when you put k levels in this, around the cylinder, Oops, T to the K is the set of total weighted configurations. Uh, T to the K AB is this total, total weighted configuration starting in, in one state A and ending K levels later in state B. Right, that's the transfer matrix. And how do, you get the, how do you get the free energy from the transfer matrix? It's just the leading, you just look at the leading eigenvalue. You need to figure out how, how T to the K grows as K gets large. And that's of course determined by the leading eigenvalue just by linear algebra, capital lambda. In fact, the free energy is just the limit as n goes to infinity of the log of the lambda. Here, here capital N is the circumference. So you imagine for each circumference, there's some eigenvalue and, and then you just take the limit of the log divided by, n, uh, divided by n as n goes to infinity. That's the free energy. That's the quantity which sort of is the fundamental quantity to calculate, to control this, to, to figure out what this model is doing. All right, and uh, as per usual for the six vertex model or many other models, T has this partial diagonalization into blocks, TK. Uh, what is TK is the transfer matrix when you have K particles, because of course the particle number is preserved. Uh, uh, if you have k particles on one row, there'll always be k particles on every ray, row. K, k is, the, uh, is essentially telling you what the s slope is. Uh, and of course, then uh, there's this, uh, the transfer matrix, diagon you have to draw, diagonalize this matrix to find the leading eigenvalue, eigen an eigenvector. And this is a sort of a uh, classical, difficult problem, which uh, Baxter explains very well in his book, um, but is you know, sort of notoriously complicated, I guess. Um, but what you find in this model, just like the other models, the six vertex model, is that uh, you can kind of find a pattern for the eigenvectors, right? For T1, 
if there's only one particle, the matrix is just a circulant matrix. And so the eigenvectors are just uh, exponentials. Uh, eh. And for T, but T2 is already uh, quite, quite complicated, although it turns out that the eigenvectors have this sort of certain form as the sum of two exponential terms. So this is an eigenvector which depends on two parameters, zeta one and zeta two. And the, the, the eigenvector, if you wanna evaluate it at a state, the state is determined by the position of two, vec of two particles at X one and X two. And it has this particular form where a a one two and a two one are, are certain constants, and and zeta one and zeta two are also two constants, which I didn't write down. Anyway, the the more generally for T k, the eigenvectors have a similar kind of form, where now that you sum over the whole symmetric group of some function, some function, some constant a sub depending on the permutation pi. And then you have this all, all possible permutations of this uh, uh, product of exponentials. And it looks kind of like a determinant. So let me call it a, a determinant, an A determinant uh, of this Vandermond type matrix. And it's, it's not actually a determinant uh, because A is not just uh, you know, the signature of the permutation, some more complicated function of the permutation. Okay, so that is the general beta ansatz. Beta ansatz is you guess that the eigenvectors have this form, and then you prove that in fact they do have this form for some particular choices of zetas and a's. Right, so there's you know k parameters in the zetas, and there's a bunch of parameters for the a's. But they're but they're you know if you read Baxter's book, you can find all the equations which they have, which how they're related. <clears throat> Uh, well, uh, okay. Then uh, uh, also in Baxter, but originally due to Sutherland, Yang and Yang, 67, uh, there's an explicit equation that, this, that those zeta variables and the A variables have to satisfy. The zeta variables have to satisfy in some equation. When you plug it in for this five vertex model, things, it's much simpler. I mean, there is a simplification which takes place over the six vertex model. The six vertex model, it's a complicated equation which people don't really know how to solve for the general case, only in some special cases. In the five vertex model, here's what you do. The equation looks like this. Uh, the denominator here, I don't know, I don't know if this, this is really important to mention, but somehow the denominator only depends on i, right? The numerator is where the, this is a product over j, the denominator only depends on i, so you might as well um, bring it to the other side. And you know we do this. The details are not so important, but you do some change of variable. You multiply, you multiply, you divide zeta by one minus r squared. You do the y. You get this new variables w, and then they satisfy some simple equation. W to some power times one minus w to some power is some quantity which is independent of the of which w you choose. Just some you can just think of some con, this is some constant because it doesn't depend on which which w you're dealing with. So this, this, this kind of interesting equation, it says that the Ws and therefore the Zetas satisfy this simple polynomial equation, W to some power times one minus W to some power equals some constant. And those equations, uh, uh, the, the solutions to the equations are nice. They're nice enough that you can sort of uh, not just graph them, you can understand which curves they lie on and so on. Here's for example, the curve the green, you know, if you look at the roots of the W to 12 times one minus W to the fourth equals constant, uh, they form these, this, this family of curves. Like one of them is the green curve, one is the blue curve, one is the red curve, depending on the, con the value of the constant. And, you know, uh, you can see that as you decrease that constant, there's some interesting point where, that, where the curve it, well, if, if the constant is large, there's one curve, and if the constant is small, there's two curves. There's some place where they, the two curves split up into two, and that, 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 that uh, transition there is, in fact, the, the origin of that stochastic phase. Uh, anyway, so the, the, but the point of this slide is that the rescaled 
quant beta roots W or the you know the right the zetas originally they lie on some petite some quite explicit uh, curves. Uh, which are called Cassini ovals. They're classically steady uh, curves, which are defined by this simple equation. And because we have those, uh, because everything is quite explicit, you can then push forward the machinery uh, that is really unavailable in the general six vertex model and get the and get the get everything to work out. Right? There's some the leading eigenvalue, which you can also read about in Baxter, has a particular form, and the asymptotics of this is now. Uh, uh, a, a feasible calculation because we understand the, the beta roots very well, the location of the beta roots very well. And so that's what we did. A bit of complex analysis, but it's not actually very hard once you know where the, where the roots lie. Okay, and this, this slide kind of is a summary of the results. Uh, which gives the relationship between the S and T variables and the X and Y variables. Remember with the X and Y are the field variables and S and T are the density variables. And it all fits in, into this, this beautiful diagram uh, in the complex plane. So here's the, here's the zero, here's one, and there's some point up here. This is a zero one Z triangle. Z is some point in the upper half plane. And uh, there's one, this point is one minus R squared. That's a point on the real axis between zero and one. <clears throat> and uh, if I take a complex point Z somewhere in the upper half plane, I can you know, draw this uh, circle between, you know, containing zero Z and one minus R squared. And then I look at the angles here and the angle there and the angle there and the angle there. And those angles determine S and T as a function of Z. Uh, right, <laughs> sorry, um, S theta is this angle, one minus S theta is that angle, so you can take the ratio and get S over one minus S. And then you, then, then you can get also theta, and then you get T. Uh, so that determines S and T as a function of Z, but, but, and then there's a formula for X and Y also as a function of Z. So, the, so uh, I, it's very hard for me to give you an, an explicit direct map from S T to X Y, but if I go through the intermediate intermediary of this, of this complex variable Z, which is the conformal parameter for the model, then both X and Y and S and T are functions of Z. And there they are. X is, you know, whatever, minus log one minus R squared minus this B function, uh, which is a variant of the die logarithm, right? B is one over pi, argue, B of U is one over pi, argue log absolute value one minus U plus imaginary part of the LI, which is a die logarithm. So what's, what the, 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 the reason the Z variable is important is because it, it uh, is the correct, uh, defines the correct conformal structure, underlying conformal structure in the model. Uh, and the, there's some, the, the W, this is this point here is W bar and it's, uh, the, there's some sort of spectral curve for the model, which I don't really want to tell you what I mean by spectral curve, but there's, there's the equation for it. W and Z are related by some analytic mapping like that. Okay, and, and once I have this sort of analytic relation between X, Y, and S, T, I can integrate that to get sigma. And that's, 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 that's why I can plot sigma, but I can't give you an explicit formula for sigma because it's kind of only defined by this implicit, an integral of some kind of implicit relationship between, but ex, I mean, explicit, but, but uh, I mean, yeah, you understand. Do you understand? How, how, how's it going? Ask some questions. You know how Zoom is, you can't get any feedback whatsoever. So you guys have to just uh, pipe up. Are there any questions about this slide? Okay, thanks, Ben. Okay, this is kind of a, a, an amazing geometric thing, which we, we had no idea was gonna happen. We just did this complicated calculation and then we realized that, uh, you know, there's this interesting triangle in there and. You know, I, I couldn't have predicted that ahead of time. Uh, but I think this, this, this sums up the, the whole calculation here in, in one simple diagram. So I, I really appreciate that, that diagram. All right, uh, what do we got afterwards? Uh, you know, 
one also, one also uh, interesting feature of the model, which I don't really need to talk about because I just told you how to do everything, sort of, uh, is that the eigenvectors of the transfer matrix happen to be determinants. Uh, I said earlier that, uh, uh, sorry, where are they? I said earlier that, uh, you know, these, 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 uh, uh, for the six vertex model, the eigenvectors can be described by these sort of A determinants. Uh, but in the five vertex model, they're actually determinants, <laughs> uh, which are kind of like Vandermont determinants, except there's some extra factors, right? So here's the, for three particles, here's what the eigenvector looks like as a function of x1, x2, and x3. It's, it kind of looks like a Vandermont, except that each row has an extra uh, sort of linear term, linear and one over z term in front of it to some power, to the first power, second power, and so on. Uh, and, uh, you know, I don't know about you, but if you've looked at Baxter's book and you've struggled to understand the, the, his proof of the, why the beta ansatz works, it's kind of difficult. Uh, there's a lot of things to check. And, uh, you know, in principle, there's a bunch of sort of series to some and, and uh, you're not, it's very hard to, you know, be convinced of that. But uh, in this particular model, because the eigenvectors have this sort of determinantal structure, which is quite clear, you can really prove the beta ansatz in just two slides. And I made an attempt here uh, uh, on these two slides. <laughs> so uh, here's the, uh, I can't even see what I'm looking at. Okay, so yeah, the, the let me go back, sorry. The, the Z's, the Z's here, which I, I was calling Zeta before, I apologize. Uh, they satisfy this particular equation, z to the n, a of z to the n equals, you know, some product, product of all the, all, all the, the zi's are the distinct roots of this uh, polynomial equation. This is just some uh, function of z, and the right-hand side is a symmetric function of all the z's, so you can just think of that as some constant. And uh, the first thing to notice about that determinant is that it's sort of circularly symmetric. If I, if instead of taking f of x0, x1, x2, I take x1, x2, and then x0, I, I translate it you know, around to plus n, then, uh, then uh, that function, I get the same function as I started with. So it is really defined on a cylinder rather than just the, the integers. I can, so I can either think of x as just being integers, or I can think of them as being on a cylinder because of this, uh, because of this formula. And the, that proof is just, at some simple manipulations of the determinant, right? Here's the determinant. I took the, just took the three by three case, uh, you know, you factor out a, an A from each column and then you, and then you, in the last, an A inverse from each column and in the last row, you see this quantity, which by the identity up here, uh, you can put in each, in each, uh, in the last row itself. Okay, anyway, that, I don't have time, but the, there's, this is just one line there. And then uh, to check that F is an eigenvector, you see what happens to a particular configuration like F of X1, X2, X3. When you apply the transfer matrix, we have to sum over the positions of all the positions of the, of the Y. Y1 lies somewhere between X1 and X2. Y2 lies somewhere between X2 and X3 and so on. And when you, right, so there's this kind of, oops, there's this kind of complicated sum, but uh, each of the terms is just a uh, geometric series. And again, because this is determinant, you just sum each row, the geometric series in each row by itself. You do a little simplification. And at the end of the day, uh, okay, it's not completely trivial, but, but, uh, you uh, once you do, do those geometric series, you you can take the the, the matrix you get and and write it as a product of two matrices. One of which is the original matrix, and the other is the the the, the, the other is this 
this is matrix which has only two diagonals, two non-zero diagonals. And of course, the, the determinant of F, I mean, the determinant of the matrix, which is the, which is F, uh, when you take the determinant, you take the determinant of this, this is the eigenvalue. So the eigenvalue turns out to be the determinant of some quite simple matrix like this. Anyway, I, I realized that that went by way, way too fast for you to appreciate, but the point is that the, you know, all that uh, difficulty that Baxter has for the six vertex model, if you, if you arrange things correctly in the five vertex model, it's just some linear algebra and some geometric series. Okay, thanks, I'll stop. Thank the speaker.